about to get started here. Lyndon? Michelle, you ready? Right, I'd like to call this Cato Parish Commission meeting in, for, to order. It is 3.32 on September 6th. Mr. Clerk, could we have a roll call, please? Absolutely. Commissioner Hopkins. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Jackson. Commissioner Young. Here. Commissioner Burrell. Here. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Gage Watts. Commissioner Taliaferro. Here, sir. Commissioner Atkins. Here. Commissioner Chavez. Here, sir. Commissioner Lazarus. Here. And Commissioner Epperson. Present. All right. You have got nine of 12 members present. That is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Commissioner Chavez, I, I didn't ask you ahead of time, but I know you're well rehearsed on your invocations. Would you mind leading us sure. in the invocation? And Commissioner Talfair, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Certainly. Everybody stand, please. All right. You bow your head. Heavenly Father, we come before you with, with many thanks. Just thanking you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings that you provide for us. Thank you that we're around this horse. You're able to do the work of the parish. We ask that you lead God and direct us through that work. And uh, just thank you for having us here and let us uh, go our way as safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'll face the flag. Let us pay tribute to the greatest country that God has ever created by signing the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Chavez. Thank you, Commissioner Talaferro. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, do we have any agenda additions? I'm not aware of any agenda additions today, uh, unless you had any. Okay. No? Okay. Moving on then, we'll move on to uh, citizens' comments. Uh, where citizens who'd like to address the commission on any issue other than zoning are asked to fill out a comment card, uh, they can be found in our chamber foyer. And if you uh, would like, then they can be uh, submitted here uh, to me. And uh, everybody is entitled to their comments uh, limited to three minutes. Um, we have received so far, I'm aware of about three requests for public comment. And I think that uh, those are with the president. Thank you, Mr. Clark. All right, to start out, Martha Merrick with the food bank. Come on up, Ms. Merrick. Hello. You, do you always come with two attorneys in tow? I do. I do. Don't be frightened. Good afternoon. My name's Martha Merrick. My address is 285. Do I need to get my address? Not necessarily. 285 Mount Zion Road, Shreveport, Louisiana. I am the executive director of the Food Bank of Northwest Louisiana, and with me are two of our board members, our board chair, Lamar Pugh, and our vice chairman, uh, Julie Bluer. 
And I am here for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I want to, of course, thank Cata Parish for their support over the many years. But I believe later today, for your consideration, is um, going to be the um, authorization of a special resolution recognizing September as Hunger Awareness or Action Month and for the work of the food bank. I have had the pleasure of being the executive director for the food bank for many years. Um, and this year marks our 25th anniversary of providing this service to the community. And we are honored to be able to do this work for not only Caddo Parish, but for all of Northwest Louisiana. Hunger Action Month is a month that um, focuses and creates awareness of hunger issues in our community. Many of you know you have worked shoulder to shoulder with me and our team to distribute uh, food in Caddo Parish. We understand the issue of hunger in our community. Many seniors, children, it's all ages. Um, suffer from food insecurity and in September we want to bring awareness to these hunger issues and we're asking citizens of um, really of the whole United States because all food banks join together to create this focus of food awareness and food insecurity so we're grateful for your consideration for the resolution um, just a little more information about the food bank. I feel like y'all all know because I feel like I'm among friends among all of you, but last year we were privileged to distribute 15 million pounds of food that had a retail value of o over $20 million. And a lot of that work is done because of you folks right here who continue to support us and believe in the work that we do. And we do that, a lot of it we distribute ourselves, but we partner with many, many organizations that help us get food to the folks that need it. These are organizations, over 150 organizations partner with us. These are soup kitchens, homeless shelters, church uh, food pantries, even organizations like Shreveport Green, who has got into the food space by creating mobile markets to get even help us get more food out into the community. And really, it takes us all working collectively and together to reach all of the individuals. Across Northwest Louisiana, the food bank reaches 75,000 individuals. Move to extend. And Second. 42,000 of those are here just in Caddo Parish. So hunger is real. It's a huge issue, and we are so delighted to be able to offer that um, service to Caddo Parish, not just during the pandemic, but beyond. We've got some real challenges. Food is very, very difficult for us to find. What you see in the grocery store is kind of the same challenges we're having, but we are committed to solving hunger, and we thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, thank you. Martha. We, uh, we, can't, we can't ask questions right. at this time, but thank you all for the work you do. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bluer and Mr. Pugh, for y'all's support of the Food Bank. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I believe it's uh, Mr. Richard Friday regarding uh, Rice Road. Welcome, Mr. Friday. Good afternoon, y'all. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Friday. I live at 4645 Rice Road, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71119. I'm here to discuss uh, Rice Road, the recent addition of a mobile home, a trailer, within the last week that was pulled out there. Uh, me and my wife built our home on Rice Road in December 2019. At that time, the realtor that was selling land out there, along with the neighbors out there, told us that previously they had met and in 2014, and it was decided that no mobile homes would be allowed on Rice Road. At this time, there is a trailer out there. The applicant submitted a, an application 
for a modular home. I'm an old country boy. I know a double wide mobile home when I see one. This is not a modular home. This this uh, trailer is going to devaluate the properties in the area, and it takes away from the character of the neighborhood. To me, there are two issues. First of all, are trailer homes allowed out there? If the present structure is indeed a modular home, or why, why is it indeed a trailer home? I guess what I'm saying, they falsified that application, which is not the subject here. I have photos of the, of the trailer. There are blocks under the trailer. And there are two tongues under each one of the sections. I guess where somebody could hook up easily and move the trailers. Regardless, why did, did the applicant apply for a modular home and put a trailer home out there? Again, this does not seem right to me. My proposal, since they got these two tongues where you can hook up and move it, have them hook up and move it. I know that's a little harsh, but what can I say? Again, basically, the, the presence of this trailer detracts from the neighborhood. Again, I'm, I'm in the fourth quarter of my life. I don't want to fight for every dollar that I have invested in this property, but I will do it. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Friday. We can't we can't <coughs> respond with you here, but I would suggest you speak to the guy back there and to Dr. Ken Ward in the Ooh. bright shirt back there. That the man raising his hand, he could talk to you about about uh, the regulations, zoning and regulations in that along Rice Road, and see if this guy is in violation or not. All right. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Mr. Gregory Turner. Good evening. Hello, Mr. Turner. Good evening. You guys doing all right? Doing fine, thank okay. you. I'm here for the same reason that Mrs. Fried is here for. Uh, we build a home out on Rice Road, and during the time that we purchased the land, we were told about the previous problem they had with trying to put up, set up a mobile home park out there. And it's the person that sold us the land, Ms. D. Davis, came from her uh, that there could be no mobile homes out there. <coughs> so I wouldn't have bought a property that I knew that would never have mobile homes across and in front and away, and away from the house, which we know is going to be, to be all developed, appreciate the value of our home. So uh, I'm okay. here with, for that purpose. Thank you very much. You might want to get with, with Dr. Ward, who's now, I think they're now right out in, in the four-year area. Okay. And, uh, and y'all can both you know, be informed at the same time. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you for coming down. We okay. appreciate yeah, it. Okay, have a good one. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Mr. Clerk. That brings us to visitors. Um, we're our first visitors today. Uh, we've got uh, Rochelle Dugan and Sherry Buffington, uh, Smith Buffington with the um, Legislative session report. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Try to get this set up. Mr. Michelle, before you make your comments, I'd like to address the board for a second. Before you proceed with the comments, uh -huh. I'd just like to let the board know who you are. And oh, okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners, uh, President uh, Atkins. This is uh, one of the members of our illustrious lobbying team along at the legislature and this is in the second year and we have Ms. Rochelle and Ms. Ms. Sherry today who is a former state representative and they have done a phenomenal job for us now as our lobbying team and keeping us up to date. A lot of those reports you all get bi-weekly come from these two ladies and they've been very responsive, very timely and uh, very available in terms of our needs. So I just want to commend them for doing a great job I actually going to come today to kind of give you an update on what things, where things have happened in the past in terms of what we are going to go in the future with respect to our lobbying initiatives. Thank you. Okay. So the, with that, Michelle, thank you for being here. Ms. Sherry, thank you for coming. 
We appreciate your presence today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sherry and I are pleased to join you today in giving you a high-level overview of the most recent 85-day regular session of the Louisiana Legislature in 2022. In addition to the regular session, we actually had several sessions in the first half of the, of the year. From February to June, we had four legislative sessions. The first extraordinary session convened February 1st through February 18th. The sole purpose of this session was to address the redrawing of the legislative, judicial, and congressional districts. As directed by law, every 10 years, in conjunction with the census, the legislature is tasked to review um, the districts based on the current population and boundaries should reflect the demographics to provide and ensure that equal representation is had by all um, citizens. When this session convened around February 18th, the lawmakers returned home, only to meet again within um, weeks, and the regular session began February 14th. During the regular session, in an unusual yet expected move, lawmakers called themselves into a veto session. So technically, they had to recess the regular session that we were in and convene the veto session. This was another single issue session. The only thing the legislators were tasked with in this session was in, they were in disagreement with the governor of his veto of their congressional redrawing of the maps. Historically, veto overrides of a sitting governor in Louisiana are rare. When the legislature agreed to override the governor's veto, it's important to note this was only the third time in the history of our state that the legislature overrode a governor's veto. In a short session, the lawmakers convened on March 30th, called for a vote. Quickly after the House and Senate gaveled in, they took the vote. Favorably, they overrode the governor's veto. This session adjourned immediately following the vote. So the following day, we reconvened the regular session. So we're on our third session now. Um, it was business as usual. Proceedings went on as usual, and we commenced till the final day when sine die adjournment was on June 6th. Then Governor Edwards called the legislature back to yet another session. This was another six-day special session. This was on the heels of federal judge Shelley Dick's ruling that struck down the Louisiana Congressional Redistricting Plan. So after he had vetoed, the, the, the legislature overrode that veto, so it was back on. Well, the judge said that we had to readdress it. The lawmakers once again returned to the state capitol, but only for a few days. However, they took no action and abruptly voted to adjourn and ended the session. So we'll talk more about the congressional redistricting in a little bit. But you can see the activities in the state capitol were quite busy during the first half of this year. And we anticipated that the year would be relatively normal post-COVID, or should I say slow down COVID, we, we anticipated a regular um, year. But back to the re regular session and what transpired, it was a session that was general in nature, basically meaning that all subject matters could be considered. The total number of bills, and this may or may not attribute to the constraints that COVID had on the legislative process, but we saw a significant increase of the number of proposed legislation from the last general session. There were 265 legislative instruments filed, 16, 1,607 passed, and as you know, some failed. Not all good idea, not all ideas are good. So the good news and the bad news is we had quite a few that passed, but several that failed. Some of, uh, some of them that, of course, we wanted to see a little bit failure. Of the 609 bills that were sent to Governor Edwards, he vetoed 28, so the end result was Louisiana has 581 new laws at the end of this session. 
We believe the most significant take of the 2022 regular session was the passage of a historic state budget. The budget for this, which began this current fiscal year, July 1st, was the state's largest budget to date. So the fiscal year 2022-23 was the state's largest budget at $47 billion. Keep in mind though that that budget is made up of a large amount of short-term surplus state dollars and federal funds. Of the $47 billion, Louisiana's operating budget for the state ended at $38.9 billion, of which $10.9 billion is state general funds. $500 million of these one-time dollars was spent on the unemployment trust fund. Another $400 million went to the New Orleans levy debt. This is another payment of the enormous $3 billion tab that Louisiana was faced with post-Katrina and the rebuilding of the levies. Three, three billion was our share. So we have to pay it back and this is another payment. 226 million in FEMA storm recovery. This again is the state share of federal dollars that came into the state for hurricane recovery for several of the, the recent hurricanes and 175 million did go to the rainy day fund for hopefully <laughs> use if needed. It's also notable that the budget included a robust investment on infrastructure trans and transportation. Hefty sums of funding were invested in water and sewer upgrades, coastal protection, sewer, as I said sewer upgrades, and road and bridge projects. Education continues also to be a legislative priority. The legislature did agree on an appropriation for teacher pay raises as well as school support workers. They also approved boosts in state funding to early childhood, K through 12, and higher education. Much effort and debate also resulted in restructuring of the healthcare funding methodology for hospitals. This is a milestone for our state and improves the access to health care for all Louisianians. Hospitals agreed to impose a, a to self-impose a provider fee in order to draw down hundreds of millions of dollars of federal federal dollars to our state. We believe the diligence of the legislature is to be applauded for their effort on this massive budget. And while the funds were abundant and spread across many needs, you as stewards of the parish's coffers can appreciate there's never enough money like much households like many of the households in our state with that said by 2025 when the current temporary 0.45 percent sales tax expires and rolls off the books we anticipate a deficit we see that fiscal cliff looming we're projecting with the roll off of that tax close to $500 million short in state general funds that we currently have. Keep in mind, much of the excess federal funds that we're currently receiving and appreciating will also dry up by then. So surpluses of today are short lived. Again, the general session um, in nature means that the legislature could consider all proposed good and bad ideas for the state, from education to insurance to criminal justice to energy to government affairs, health care, infrastructure, and all things in between. As a collector of sales taxes, it's important to understand that the conversation continues on tax reformation and specifically streamlined centralized collection system. The failure of Amendment 1 in the November 2021 elections, the proposed constitutional amendment, which proposed a centralized sales tax collection agency, was rejected by 52% of the voters across the state. As a result, though, the House of Representatives Speaker Clay Schickschneider introduced House Bill 681, which, which proposed to provide 
for the modernization of the collection of state and local taxes. The measure died on the calendar. However, Senate Bill 244 by Senator Brett Allen passed and became Act 669. This new law requires the legislative auditor and the Louisiana Uniform Local Sales Tax Board to develop one a uniform reporting schedule for audit reporting by local sales tax collectors that are compensated by the sales tax collections to also develop reporting schedules and standardize uniform reporting. It also changes reporting timelines. Again, Louisiana's tax code, code and the reformation of taxes will continue to be on the for forefront of many statewide leaders and legislators. We will likely see more legislation next session in regard to streamlining and modernization of the sales tax collection system, especially with the hard to capture online sales. That's a big driver of them wanting to centralize it. Also important to you as a parish, as well as business and pro businesses and property owners, is House Bill 581 by Representative Vinnie St. Blanc. It became Act 52. It provides relative to the Louisiana underground, underground Utilities and Facilities Damage Prevention Law. It changes the time frame of reporting from four hours to two hours notification for emergency excavation and gubernatorial declared states of emergency. In today's digital world, we are all dependent on fast, full coverage internet services. Broadband service, connectivity, and connection speed challenges with broadband, the challenges quickly surface, surfaced as a result of increased virtual meetings and distance learning that was brought on by the onset and the quarantine periods of COVID-19. House Bill 1080 by Representative Darrell Desitels, which became Act 288, makes changes to the gumbo, the grant program, including definitions of broadband service and the underserved. Senate Bill 6, uh, 760, I'm sorry, by Senator Gerald Boudreau became Act 455. This provides for the Office of Broadband and Connectivity within the Office of the Governor. In regard to GUMBO, the grants, and, and GUMBO stands for Granting Underserved Municipalities Broadband Opportunities. The grant program awarded is awarded to underserved areas of the state. Over one point, I'm sorry, over 167.2 million was awarded throughout the state providing aid to, 81, to over 81,000 locations in the state. Caddo Parish was awarded dollars to aid 1,250 locations, including Comcast had a $9.3 million project and they were awarded grant dollars in the amount of 5.9 million. CSC Holdings LLC had a three a three plus million dollar project and they were awarded 1.5 million. That's to go to building the infrastructure. Broadband, the Broadband for Everyone Commission, sorry about that, has set a goal to bring bro broadband service with increased download speeds to every citizen by 20 29. Governor Edwards has announced that the state expects to receive an additional to receive additional federal monies and increase to flow down to the um, parishes. I think right now at the first the first onset of grant awards covered 50 parishes and I think the second one might have addressed all of the the additional 14. So I think all of our parishes have been touched by this money so far. Um, Governor Edwards did announce additional funds and Sherry and I will keep you uh, updated as the program, the, the program progresses and we see more funds coming into, into the, are, are drawn down to the um, local areas. We don't anticipate any special sessions prior to the next regular session um, in 2023. 
which convenes April 10th for 40, 45 days during a 60 day calendar period. This is an odd number year that we're going into. And by law, the session is considered a fiscal session and they can only, legisl the legislature can only address the budget and any increase, decrease, levy, authorization, or repeals of fees and legislation in regard to tax exemptions, exclusions, deducting, deductions, reductions, repeals, or credits, and local bills, of course. Please note that proposals for legislation regarding local government must be requested by Wednesday, February 15th. This allows for timely publication and, of course, preparation for, for the documentation. Then, of course, each of the 144 legislators are allowed an additional five other subject or non-fiscal related bills. So you have potentially 720 more bills. Again, remember that because legislators have only five bills, it's important to prepare potential proposals for new legislation early and identify an author as soon as possible. So as we move into um, the next year, if you have anything you're considering, the sooner the better that we identify an author and get the subject matter on the front burner so we can start working on it. I'm gonna pass the baton over to Sherry and let her address redistricting. Hello, Ms. Buffington. Hi, I'm Sherry Buffington, and it's good to be home and see so many of you. Um, I'll try to be brief in these comments regarding redistricting, but I do think it's important um, to sort of understand how this impacts the state and how it drills down into Caddo Parish. Um, as Rochelle said, the halls of the Capitol were extremely busy in the first half of the year. Without a doubt, redistricting took center stage. Um, I have to tell you, it was probably one of the most contentious redistricting ses sessions that I've seen in quite a while. Legislators, of course, are required to redraw districts according to census data, and they have to be in compliance with mandatory federal requirements based on the Federal Voting Rights Act. You think of redistricting almost as a puzzle in that you're shifting precincts among districts. So part of that puzzle includes majority-minority population, communities of interest consideration, meeting allowable variances in population per district, and of course geographic boundaries, as well as compactness of the district. Um, always inherent in redistricting is politics. Elected officials, at the end of the day, have a great interest in retaining their voter base. The, the 2020 census data showed that Louisiana had a 2.7%, bear with me, I'm gonna read because I want these numbers correct, had a 2.7% population increase since 2010 and a total population of 4.7 million. However, the growth in population across America increased by 7.4% during that same decade. Louisiana was among only three states that grew by less than 5%. 45 of Louisiana's 64 parishes lost population. Significant to the population transnationally, rural America lost residents while metropolitan suburbs tended to gain that population. In Louisiana, this was apparent in the additional population of southern met metropolitan suburbs and the decline of population in northern Louisiana. North and central parts of the state saw population fall by 3.7%. Since 2010, Caddo Parish had an 8.8 .8 population decrease, with the shreveport bossier metro area falling by 3%. In contrast, Bossier Parish grew by at least 10%. Specifically in Louisiana, and I kind of want to give you a broader picture, um, St. Bernard Parish saw the largest population increase at 21.9%. Eight other parishes grew by 10% or greater. Ascension, West Baton Rouge, St. Tammany, Calcasieu, Orleans, Livingston, Bossier, and Tangipahoa parishes. Tinsall Parish saw the largest decrease in population at 21%. Another five parishes lost more than 15% of their population. Cameron, Claiborne, Madison, Red River, and West Carroll. 
In sharp contrast, South Louisiana saw the bulk of population increases. New Orleans had the largest increase at 6.9%. Greater Baton Rouge, 5.9%. Southwest Louisiana and Lake Charles area, 5.1%. And Acadiana, slightly less than 1%. And the reason that I think it's important to understand those numbers and to look at them broadly across the state, population shifts drive changes in your representation. Not one Senate district north of I-10 grew in population, resulting in Senate District 37, which is currently held by Senator Barrow Peacock, being moved to the North Shore. Um, also House District 23 by Representative Kenny Cox was allocated among into the contiguous districts. And I think that the takeaway here will be that North Louisiana is going to feel the effects of these losses in direct and indirect ways. The direct impact will be the loss of two districts. Indirectly, that will mean fewer committee assignments, smaller Northwest Louisiana delegation, and this compounds the historic struggle of North Louisiana's competition with South Louisiana for appropriations, capital outlay projects, and influence. The population shifts are also expected to affect calculations of federal revenue sharing allocations by the state. Um, I'll switch to the congressional. Litigation continues in regard to the congressional redistricting. However, uh, please note that by law, elections will proceed and be, as scheduled and be validated. In the event that the redistricting is overturned by the courts, we will adhere to their directive and make necessary changes for the next election cycle that follows. In closing, I want to thank each of you for allowing us to represent the Caddo Parish Commission at the State Capitol. We appreciate the opportunity to serve citizens through you. And as always, we stand ready to be of any assistance and look forward to continued working with you. And please always don't hesitate to call us if there's anything that we can help you with. Um, and we'll be happy to provide additional information or answer questions. Thanks so much. Okay, I think uh, Commissioner Burrell has a question. I don't know if it's for you, Ms. Buffington, or for Mr. Dugas. Well, she can stay there while, while you're there. Sure, <coughs> sure it's good to see you. And, and uh, I noticed that um, that uh, Dr. Dr. Wilson said uh, she was a representative, but actually a former senator also <laughs> so to make that clear and being the daughter of one of our former commissioners uh, jim smith and i hope hopefully jim is doing well and uh miss dugas i've worked with both these ladies uh over a period of time as a legislator from a legislative standpoint and also from a lobbyist standpoint my question since you're you're there on the redistricting uh I recognize that, that we've had loss, population loss here. Is there an independent analysis that's done by the state to kind of give us a feel for why this is happening? We talk about it, but you don't hear people giving you a reason. And maybe within that reason, we can look at shifting some things that would help uh, uh, create some help for us up here even if it's even if it's a marginal adjustment uh, you know to a formula or something like that I can tell you that there are different organizations cable and par both have tried to analyze these trends across the state um, I think that one of the important questions if I were still in office today I would ask is what is the age group that is leaving Louisiana and why are they leaving um, I hate to say I almost want to do an exit interview. If you're leaving Louisiana, why are you leaving? Is it job opportunities? Is it family? Is it the economy? What's impacting that move? Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to go through those rather staggering numbers at times is to help you understand how that's going to impact you in the state budget and often impact some of the opportunities you have. Um, but yes, there are groups that are starting to analyze that and I hope that Cato would be on board with that. I hope we can glean some information because that is gonna continue if, uh, you know, if we don't address it in, in, in some fashion. I know part of, part of the reason is, is, is if they get more money down there, you get more industry, and people normally gravitate toward their, you know, where the jobs are. 
So uh, I could understand that despite uh, that area being one of the areas that is mostly, you know, is always devastated, but, the, but you know, but the jobs and uh, jobs are there and, um, and I, I can see that happening. The second thing, and I, I, it's um, having to do with orphan wells. Um, I know uh, Commissioner uh, Epperson has something on the agenda for that, but I've had a somewhat of a hard time. I'm over the Natural Resource Committee here, and, and we are addressing orphan wells. I've sent a letter to the coordinator, I guess, of, 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 of uh, those that are that deals with orphan wells. I understand it comes under the Department of Natural Resources also at the state level. But that being the case, and the majority of the wells being in Caddo Parish, I'm not sure why we're not more involved as a commission to monitor this activity. It seems like everything goes through the state, the contract goes through the state, um, uh, any activity associated with it, I, I understand maybe public works touch on it, but I think as a representative of the people in this area, we should have more input, uh, uh, you know, into that process because because it is uh, such a important area of environmental uh, concern. So you all being our lobbyists, if you could pass that on, I, I, like I said, I have not gotten the answers that I've been seeking, and, and I will seek them again. And given the fact that I, I believe the allocation this time is around $25 million for this area, but yet still we have no input in any of it. So that's so that's that's my complaint. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Burrell. Commissioner Epperson. Uh, Dr. Wilson, if I heard right, uh, I think we should be interacting with these uh, young ladies yesterday as far as what we need to get on the legislative docket in the upcoming uh, legislative <laughs> session. So I would ask that uh, you know how you do our legislative priorities? Yes. That, yes, sir. Uh, we would start that process now mm -hmm. and get them to you, through you, to them. Mm -hmm. Does that, that sound okay with everybody? Yes, because uh, I think last year it was over, uh, it was over 1,500 bills that was filed even before the session started. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> and we're talking about having a legislative lunch in February. That's correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you, sir. You're right, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner uh, Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question perhaps for our lobbying team. Perhaps administration can help answer it too. Yes, it's sir. about the sales tax um, changes that you mentioned. Um, is there a, a <coughs> belief and a plan in the legislature that um, it will be easier for, for localities such as ours to get their fair share of online sales tax revenue if it is processed by Baton Rouge first? Some believe that, <laughs> but the conversation and the debate, the debate continues that perhaps no. But there is still the challenge, not just by Louisiana, across the United States and probably, you know, the world, on adequate, adequately tax, taxing the purchases, the collection of such, and the distribution of such. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing, as, as everyone attempts to understand the process and how they can streamline it and get it back properly to where it belongs, they still don't have all the answers. So it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a moving target, so to speak. I see. So, so they I, are working on it. So when I make a purchase on Amazon and I pay $5 in tax, where does that money go now, the $5? Does it go, <laughs> does it go somewhere? It should come to the local um, state and sales tax office. So to, to be, does it come to Caddo Parish? Uh, yes, sir. If you take delivery in Cattle Parish, it should come to if Cattle it, Parish. If it's delivered to my Cattle address, it should address. go to yes, here. It goes to the place over by Knight Street where I used to pay my sales tax. Yes, sir. Um, and um, for administration, do we know if our sales tax receipts have dropped as a result of online sales, or do we suspect that as a result of online sales, or uh, I'm, we don't I'm, know? I'm not sure of the answer on that, sir. We have to research that for you. 
Okay. Because I, I, don't, I don't know who, you know, if we get a report on it or not. Sure. Now, hold on for a second. Okay. Second, we can report on online sales tax. Okay. Okay. We, Commissioner Young, we'll have to ask that question and see okay. and get a report back to you on that. It would be an interesting thing for us to yes, learn sir. about. I'm, I'm just concerned um, these two lobbying professionals mentioned the competitiveness that we have with um, right. South Louisiana based on allocations, and it just makes, makes right. probably all of us a little concerned if all of the tax revenue is going to be going there first, whether, yes. what, whether and what we'll get back. Yes, sir. And, and also, we should be equally concerned about the population also determines the federal appropriations we get, too. Yes. Well, we're all concerned about our population loss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Young. Commissioner Chavez. Ladies, I'll, 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 Commissioner Chavez. I, I Commissioner don't want to interrupt Dr. Wilson. Sir, I yield to you. You had a question oh, for the okay. Um okay. I'll, I'll wait if, if, if we're still in an explanation. What me, sir? We're good. Uh, okay. Thank you, President. Mm -hmm. uh, great, uh, great recap. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was it was very thorough. Um, any wins for us? <laughs> <laughs> we like to believe you had some wins, and we like to believe we we stopped a few little hiccups along the way. Um, I, I, someone um, that was visiting, we were visiting with her before, I don't remember the lady's name, but she mentioned, she said, oh, what an easy session it was because there was so much money. Well, you know, there's additional problems that extra money brings. You know, if extra money goes into your business or your home, where are you going to spend it? Are right. you going to save it all? So that whole conversation became a little bit heated and the debate continued as to are we going to, some wanted to save it all. Some wanted to spend it all. So it was, the process took some time to get where they were. I think they were, they were prudent in their appropriations. They did a little bit of both. They were very, um, they were very uh, diligent in using one-time monies for only non-reoccurring expenses. So you won't have to see that when we, don't, when we lose the money. I'm not, I'm not sure I answered your question or uh, helped yeah, yeah, answer. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm following. Um, it's, it's tough. It's tough because above I-10, um, you know, we're always lost in the shuffle, and it seems like now we're going to be lost e even more. Um, it, it seems like the legislator, absent of the, of the votes of the people statewide, they still want the centralized uh, tax. Um, it's, it sounds like, regardless, they're going to move forward. That, and, and, and I get it. I think there's only four or five states in the union that don't do that. Um, but Commissioner Young brings up a good point. Uh, if the state legislator can pass legislation to allow us to know from what parish we are gambling, they should let us, they, we should be able to know from the IP address of this phone where I'm physically buying something right. on Amazon. And I think uh, we're getting closer. And, and frankly, I think it's a good thing that it's been a slower process and that people had more time to think about the boot on the ground implementation, how it was actually going to function. So many times I find that it's not necessarily a great idea to pass something the first year. You need to really think about it, debate it, argue if necessary. Um, and I'll tell you, there's, there are strong opinions on both sides. Uh, of that. Na naturally uh, understandably so. so. You know, local governments, frankly, um, I think often uh, feel like that they depend on those funds to cash flow. And that's, that's a concern that we heard over and over. We heard it from many sheriffs. Um, so I think I would use the word transparency. I think that local governments are going to have to be assured that they can follow that dollar and then be ensured that that dollar is coming back to them. And, and most importantly, that it's coming in a timely matter, manner. And if they can't do that, then we've got a problem and maybe we should step back. And, and the first step was taken in standardizing. So you had all these tax collectors and they weren't, do, they weren't collecting in the same way. Right. So the, they, they've already taken the first step. And maybe, maybe the answer, maybe at the end of the day, they won't centralize it. But that each one will be reporting, each, each entity will be reporting 
the same information in the same way and it will go to a central collection point. The reports will go to a central point in the state. Standardization is a must. We actually, part of the city of Shreveport is within the parish of Bossier and it makes it very tough for businesses to identify what, what they owe. So while you were boots on the ground, the entities that they're gonna set up to actually do those tax collections, they're gonna, they're gonna fund those, as you stated. They're gonna have to fund those. So how is that, is it gonna come off of the sales tax derived locally? Is it gonna, is it gonna come from the budget from the state legislator? Can you expand on that? That's part of what they're, they're, they're tasked to do. So they don't have a clear defined path. No, they just they no. just know that they that's want to set up these. That's what they need. Yeah. They need to define it so they can implement it. And I so that's, that's what they're tax, tasked to do. And I, I think that's part of the debate and the discussion. Um, and it, it, Come to the mic it seems I've spent a lot of time to around. The mic I'm sorry. Thank you. It, it seems I've spent a lot of time around the Cato Commission through the years. And um, to me, it also comes down to what's more efficient and what's more cost effective. If, if you're shouldering that cost, it may indeed be cheaper, more efficient for you to continue to collect those taxes. And so I would urge you to be very vocal, very present in those discussions and to ask hard questions. Um, I, always, I always think, you know, great policy sounds great on paper, but if it doesn't work when you implement it and in that process, you really didn't accomplish a great deal. So in reality, it's got to work for you. It's got to work for Caddo. Thank you for your work down there representing us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Thank President. You. Thank you, mm -hmm. Commissioner Chavez. Um, seeing no one else on the board, I did receive a request from Commissioner Jackson to ask about the Southern University Law Center. Can you all comment on that? Any, any additional ground gain there? Not, I, I don't know that there's a great deal of movement. Um, you ask about, uh, Commissioner Chavez, you asked about some of the wins. I think that there were significant investments made in all of education, both K through 12 and higher ed in this area. Um, I think you're gonna see significant investments in infrastructure here as a result. And, and keep in mind though, much of that will be one-time money. So uh, I always caution people, enjoy it while you have it this year, make the best use of it, but be guarded, don't be dependent on it, because next year, no. that amount of money may not be there for you. Okay, I've, I've, got, I've got something that's been on my mind sure. uh, since the discussion began, actually since I read your letter uh, that was emailed <clears throat> last week. Um, reflecting what Commissioner Epperson said, nowhere in your, in your whole report did I hear anything about the priorities of Caddo Parish. Nowhere did I hear did I hear anything listing the items that we've had listed as a priority and what you all have done to advance those those issues. So moving forward next year, could we make sure that we have that you all have our list of priorities and encourage us to get that list of priorities when you need it, you know, yeah. in order to be effective. And then please work on those priorities and then report back on those priorities. Because your current report very informative but very broad and had very little to do with Caddo Parish's priorities. So can we can we do that as a as a uh, uh, continuous improvement effort? Sure. Yeah, okay. Commissioner Thank Atkins, uh, not to disrupt your, your flow there, but we do provide the uh, list to our lobbying team, but but like Commissioner Epperson said we need to do it earlier. Well because even sometimes it's like pull when we when we provide it we still should be focused on that, and your report did not show any focus on our legislative priorities. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. But I think the key to it is, is designating, uh, selecting a, a legislator who will carry that, those items for us well in advance of the filing so they can go ahead and get submitted. So we, we, we have a tendency to is that we actually you our thoughts and we put the list together, but, but you know, the cow's out, out the gate after that, so to speak. We need to do it way in advance, and the Commissioner Epperson was saying he was right. We just I'm need to do the process I'm earlier, sorry. and then because we ask you all, who would you like to see carry this legislation for us? Well, that that is our consultant. Yes, you know, sir. Role. Mm. Well, that, well, we had to do the, some some groundwork, but they, they also assist us by being our eyes and ears to make sure things are flowing, and also our advocates to talk for us when we're not present. But we have to do our due diligence to identify those requirements and someone that could carry it for us, and then they 
get the baton and run with it from there. All right. Well, maybe we aren't doing our job. Uh, but, well, but, but I just know that, that, that there was no mention of, of our priorities in this report, which implies to me that our priorities aren't being represented and, uh, and um, sponsored in Baton Rouge. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh -huh. Commissioner Atkins, if I could, I think it's important um, to understand the timing process. And by the time session starts, a lot of things are already in place. So my plea to you would be um, staff has that budget and they're beginning to work on that budget in November. Really, some of it in October. I used to be staff before I was in office. Um, by December, it's pretty much baked. Uh, January, the governor's going to present his executive budget. He's going to present capital outlay, HB2. And so you have a series of deadlines where you really do need to try to get those priorities in place. Um, and so that's what I'm pleading with you. It, it, we need that information in the fall, early fall. Okay, possible. so Dr. Wilson, can we get our legislative list yes, to sir. them in the early fall this year? Ye yes, sir. We, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll have a template we coming will, forth. We will attempt to do so, our job better, and then we'll ask that y'all focus on those issues sure. and, and push those issues. I mean, we are your clients, so those should be your areas of focus. Thank Absolutely. you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry, Commissioner Burrell had yeah. another question. Going back, <clears throat> going back to broadband, mm -hmm. uh, since there have been a uh, recent announcement of, of, of the grants. Uh, re we received a letter saying that that uh, the grants are being held up in certain areas uh, because <coughs> larger providers, use the term larger providers, are now complaining. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm not sure what the complaint was because the letter did not say. Can you share with us what's going on with that issue? There is and whether or not you all can get involved in that, because when it comes to us, I don't, I don't plan for us to, to, to halt our activities because of some litigation that's going on. Right, and it is, it is there is lit litigation involved. Therefore, there is little that can be done until the litigation is settled. Now, it is my understanding, and I don't remember the exact date, but they were pushing to, to move a decision quicker and I think, I apologize, but I want to say it was no, a November date, that, a November deadline that they said they'd have a decision by. The decision but I can get what, the exact- on, on the litigation, on the litigation. Of clearing it up? Uh, attempts to clear it up. Attempts you know, they can, they can file an appeal, but they were hoping to have it by, by November-ish. I'll get that exact date to you, though. Well, if you would, follow I up will. with us uh, and with Woody. I will get that exact uh, date. On that, so that we can stay on top of that uh, mm -hmm. issue since, since it's just not coming out. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner Burrell. Yeah. Commissioner Johnson. You can take me off. Uh, okay. I'll, I won't even talk about it. Okay. Thank you all. We yeah. appreciate your report, sure. and uh, we look forward to working with you all in the future. Yeah. Yes, Good thank seeing you. you. And I always know that I am local. Um, I'm happy to meet with you, try to go through priorities, or um, try to give some guidance if there's particular things that you find of interest. Um, try to make sure that you understand the timing um, and while there may be what I call technical paper deadlines I'm always going to be very candid with you and say you really should get this in 30 45 days ahead of time it's it's important to get that to the staff before that well, process I, begins. I'll just make the ob observation that uh, those priorities you know there are new things that pop onto that list but there are certain items on that list that have been on for the seven years I've been on the Commission mm -hmm. so you know Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wilson, let's yes, get sir. the list yes, to Ms. Buffington and let's um, yes, sir. let's start working on it. Glad to do okay. that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Okay. The next <clears throat> item on uh, your agenda is a uh, a visit from uh, the Shreveport City Marshal James Jefferson. Uh, as I understand it, that there's been a change to the schedules. Perhaps this is yeah. Uh, motion be. to advance to Thursday. He's going to come visit on Thursday. Second. Well, we have a motion from Commissioner Chavez to move this to Thursday. A second from Commissioner Epperson. Any comments? No, sir. How many people do we already have speaking on Thursday? Um, <clears throat> there's fewer than today, but there are. No, I mean, but, but don't we have some others that won't? There are, I believe, two others um, that are scheduled for Thursday. So I think you would have a total of three visitors. Okay. For right. Thursday. 
All right. And then I believe there's also an administrative report from Parks and uh, <coughs> from the Parks Department. We ready to vote? Okay, let's vote on moving to Thursday or not. All right, and that motion carries with 10 in support, none in opposition, and two absent. Uh, that brings us to uh, our next visitor, which is Chris Chandler of the American Millennium Project. Welcome, Mr. Chandler. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chris Chandler, 1008 Carlsbad Drive, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71115. It's good to be with you all today. Uh, I'm coming here because I've, uh, I've been working on a project for Caddo Parish, Shreveport, my hometown, for the better part of 30 years, uh, officially a nonprofit, 22 years in length. Um, I'm a business retired from the business world, worked in real estate most of that time. I did economic development work for the Chamber of Commerce, was a business recruiter, uh, worked for corporate America like Target Corporation a few years. Uh, so I have a business background. I now run a nonprofit. Uh, that's a, I guess that's an NGO uh, as it falls under the commission uh, that you guys deal with often. Um, I, what I wanted to share with you is an experience. Um, when I started my nonprofit work, it was always with the hope and intention to never ask the government, not any government, local, state, or federal, or school board, uh, to support my organization, but rather to ask the business community who has a vested interest in my mission, which I'll tell you about in a second, uh, to ask them to step forward and support the organization. Um, that has changed over the years. Uh, in recent years, uh, my board has advised me that I have to shift gears and I should compete for our local uh, government dollars as an organization that is doing good in this community. Um, so let me back up. Uh, American Millennium Project is the organization that I started. 22 years ago, um, right at the Millennium. That's why I named it the Millennium Project. Um, at that time, uh, the vision for it was a national project. Uh, we launched from Washington, D.C. Uh, the mission was to teach a part of history that was not taught anywhere across our country, which was local history um, and local culture to the local communities. So as you can think back to your days in school, you'll recall that you were taught a little bit of your state history, your U.S. history, and your world history as the formal education process, but you weren't taught about your local community. I assume not all of you are from Caddo Parish, but I grew up in Caddo Parish. I went to all my education was here locally, including college. Um, I got very little taught to me about Shreveport or Caddo Parish at all growing up in this community. Um, we just had a presentation talking about population decline. Um, I see my organization as a little piece of the pie, a little sliver that can help address things like people wanting to leave a community. Um, I think one of the main things with our young people, because I've been working in the school systems, is that they don't know anything about Shreveport. Uh, they do know that Dallas is a booming economy. They know Houston and Austin, which are very close to us, are booming. So often they look and they go to those places and their parents say, hey, please get the heck out of here and go where the grass is greener. Um, I'm convinced, and I'm convinced because I do know Shreveport, because I have taken it on my initiative uh, to learn Shreveport history and culture and meet the different people in the community and try to understand what it is that's happening in my hometown. So I have a unique perspective because I've had a great interest in that. I know most people's interest is not in that, um, but I do believe that they should be taught as much as possible. I'm saying they. We all should be taught as much as possible about the community that we live in, especially our youth and our children. Um, so I developed American Millennium Project to teach local history and local culture to the locals, not to the tourists, not what Billy Nungesser wants me to do, which is open up my tours to out-of-towners and make that a priority. My priority is to educate and teach Caddo Parish history to Caddo Parish residents. Um, so how do I do that? I don't want to become a teacher. I don't want to go in a classroom. I don't want to be part of that process. So I've created a nonprofit that offers the education. 
uh, completely voluntary. So organizations in Caddo schools starting at middle school, all through high school, and all of our local three universities in Caddo all have the opportunity to start an AMP club at the school. The clubs would offer my tours that I've developed over 22 years in Caddo Parish, of which I have about 20. 20 unique historical tours just within the borders of our parish. Each one of those 20 tours is a three to four hour experience where you get to walk through, touch, smell, sense the history by visiting the historical and culturally significant sites in Caddo Parish. So if you think about that for just a second, 20 tours, three to four hours on each one of them, I've done a lot of research, I've done a lot of reading, I've done a lot of talking to individuals and historians, businessmen, and professors, church leaders, nonprofit leaders, community leaders. I've met with many people to develop the sites that we select for the tours. Um, I would put out there that our tours are very entertaining for the young people, but at the end of the day, they have learned things that will be with them for a lifetime. Um, I've gotten this in feedback from the students. I'd be glad to share with you. I've gotten this in feedback from the professors that were on the tour with us, the teachers, the educators. And I'm real happy with what we've been able to put together. And we have now decided to take it statewide. And I'm currently working in seven parishes in Louisiana, teaching local history, local culture, the model that I built in Caddo. We're expanding it all around the state. Next year, we go into Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, so it's a local project that's got a vision to go back to a national project. But I don't want to leave Caddo behind, even though, of course, the more you work in a community, the more likely that you might be seen as somebody that doesn't have anything to offer because we already know you. We've heard you before. We've seen some you know, things. We've there are various reasons why locals don't succeed in their local community. <laughs> so they go off and they succeed elsewhere. We all know many people that have done that, I'm sure, in our own families. Um, I've had that same experience here. So whereas Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Lafayette, Lake Charles, Monroe, and Alexandria have seen the American Millennium Project and have welcomed it with open arms and with great enthusiasm, Caddo Parish, not so much. Um, so I started with the school system, Caddo Parish Schools. I've been in the schools developing these clubs for years. We've had a good track record. Recently, I tried to advance it with Caddo Schools after coming before this committee right here, your board, uh, who advised me, Chris, we got a lot of money to give out. We don't see you as one of them for this year, but please start with the Caddo School System. They've got a whole lot of money. Ask them first. If they say no, come back. Well, I have asked them. They haven't said no. In fact, they encouraged me in the beginning to seek the money. So we're still in that process playing political games because, as you know, history is a very touchy matter, not only nationwide, but certainly locally. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting most of you individually on the commission. Um, I've been around for a long time. But uh, what I've found is, is there, you know, when you try to teach history, everybody wants to know what history are you going to teach. So red flags go up immediately. Tell me, I want to see the details. Show me the details. What are you teaching our young people? Well, the problem is, is I'm teaching the real history. And therein lies the problem. Our history in Caddo Parish is not one of just wonderful news. It's not a great, man, I love my hometown once I learn the history of my hometown here in Caddo. Probably the same anywhere. But so when we teach local history, we do, AMP teaches some issues that are very touchy and sensitive. And for that, that's probably a good reason why I've been getting the push off by a lot of uh, local community leaders and business leaders and political leaders. I understand that. So I'm here today just to give you a little bit of background information on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I have no political motives behind the work that I do. Um, I strictly uh, believe that this city has so much to offer its residents, and we are losing them left and right. An example that I talked about, Bird High School, I had 35 kids, they were juniors and seniors. I asked the group 
um, how many of them planned on residing in Caddo and Shreveport after they graduated college. Most of all of these 35 were going off to college. How many of them planned to come back, raise the family, be a business, do something good for their hometown? And of the 35, not one had the strength to dare to raise their hand among their peers and admit to that, that that was a possibility. If that doesn't raise the red flag of we've got a challenge, we've got something that we need to work on, there's nothing that does it better than that. These kids don't want to be here in Caddo. Okay, and now these are kids that have opportunity to go elsewhere, so they're going to go. Not all of our kids have opportunity to do that. So AMP is really particular about getting my program into Green Oaks and the Woodlawn, to the schools that are struggling that don't have 40 different student organizations for their students to join. Uh, believe it or not, Caddo Parish schools are greatly not equal in what they offer our students. I'll put it to you nicely. Um, AMP is an opportunity for all the students of Caddo. Um, I'm not going to ask for money this year. I'm not going to ask the school board for money this year, the rest of the year. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to approve the project and then come back to you next year and, uh, and ask you to consider supporting this and making it available, helping me make it available quicker, sooner, rather than a five-year plan a one-year plan to make AMP available in every school. And what that would look like is, is my number one cost is transportation. So we're gonna be eventually buying the bus. We're not using Caddo Parish school buses, we're using uh, professional trailways buses. That's what I've always done, except for on rare occasions. So we have a couple of expenses that we're gonna ask for some support from the commission, the city council, uh, the school board. But this is, um, I think y'all got, did y'all get, Jeff, did they get this sheet of paper, the seven interests that I emailed you earlier today? Not today. Okay. So AMP, I'm going to let y'all ask me some questions. Again, local history for the local people. It's my passion. I've been doing it for 22 years. I've been doing it for two years full time as this is my career. This is the rest of my life. Um, and so I really believe that it has the potential to, to change lives. Not only do I take students on history tours, but I have a leadership program that's above most any of them. Key Club, Beta Club, you name the club and schools. My leadership program is phenomenal and it's based upon a lot of success from other clubs that I've built it from. Our character program is another thing that we offer our student members. As you know, we don't teach character like we used to for good or for bad. Our character program that I've developed doesn't try to define God or who God is or anything like that, but it talks about fundamental values that we all can share. And it lifts up people who have taught those values through the course of history. So we have a leadership program, we have a character program, we have a financial literacy program, and then we network the students in today's schools with their alumni. So I'm gonna be asking each one of you, if you did go to a school in Caddo Parish, to be an alumni ambassador uh, to the club that you went to middle school and high school to. Uh, and we're gonna ask leadership from around the community to come back into the schools to teach these kids in our club who you are and how you rose to success in your life and why you stayed in Shreveport. Those type of things are all built into my program. Um, volunteerism and public service is part of it. So all of my students, when they go on a tour, they have a meal together and then they do a service project together in the area that they just learned about that was on their tour. So a big component is teaching our young people to give back. Um, and we will be doing that with Caddo Parish Parks. So tying back to you and your organization, you'll have some amazing parks in Caddo Parish that you all manage and oversee. Our students are going to get to go visit them intentionally to see all of them and to serve them, help be a part of uh, cleaning them up and making them um, accessible to everybody. Um, two other things. Uh, AMP, along with the history, is the culture. Two minutes, thank you. So the history component is has its struggles with how do we teach history locally that's challenging. Um, but the other part is the culture. So we have a great diverse culture. Um, I've served on the Multicultural Commission in the past. 
I understand the different cultures in the community, and I think they're amazing. And the more you learn about them, the more you like this community. So we teach culture, but we celebrate culture. But we do a lot of that through music and through sporting events that we will sponsor in the community. So AMP just sponsored uh, a comeback of the Louisiana Hayride about four weeks ago. We had 40 musicians, bands from all around the country came to perform on Elvis's stage at the Louisiana Hayride. They were all here because they wanted to be on that stage. We coordinated that and we celebrated a part of our history and culture through that. We will be uh, last minute, bottom of the ninth, attempting to prevent the demolition of Fairgrounds Field. As we all know, that is already slated, that's already contracted, it's already set to go, they've already taken the bats out, and they're gonna tear it down, and we're gonna try to prevent that in a, in a last minute effort, because sports is something that I grew up with. I know the value, what it teaches, team building. We take away something like that, baseball, we take away that opportunity for the community. It's an easy fix and easy uh, to solve the problem of Fairgrounds Field if we don't tear it down. So we are involved in a lot of different things. I'm gonna leave my time open now for any questions that anybody might have. Please, the hard questions you, I really appreciate. Thank so. you, Mr. Chandler. Commissioner Chavez. Thank you, President. Uh, I agree with the, a lot of the kids don't know the history. And LBJ and I were meeting with some of the younger generation earlier and they didn't know who Captain Shree was or the great Raff or, or what he actually did. Um, so I think it'd be uh, very valuable to teach the next generation that my only question is from the school board standpoint because as i understand it your tours you said about three hours yeah are the is the school board going to allow the kids to leave yeah. during the day like as good as question a yeah so in the in the past field trips were very encouraged on the school system about 10 years ago they started saying let's no more letting the students leave they went away with the philosophy of a the value of a field trip so our tours are a full day excursion from the school, but they only happen twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring for each club. So they're only leaving campus two times for the year. And I've gotten that approved. That's cool, okay. Thank you, President, that was my question. Thank you, Commissioner Chavez. Anyone else on the board? Seeing no one else, thank you, Mr. Chandler. Thank, thank you, you for coming down. Appreciate it. Mr. Everson. Okay, that brings us to the uh, next visitor that we have today, Mr. Robert Wyandon from Rice Rec. Welcome, Mr. Wyandon. Uh, my name is Robert Wyandon. I live 4748 Rice Road, Shreveport, Louisiana. And I'm here today with a group like for the ones from Rice Road to stand or hold your hand up. <coughs> and <laughs> we're here concerning, uh, they've moved the uh, mobile home in. Do you have the pictures? I had to. Michelle, would you put those uh, photos up? They've, they've moved the mobile home in with, with, yeah. without notifying anyone. Now, back in 2014, the same owners applied for a permit for a mobile home and it was denied. And the reason it was denied was because uh, it wasn't fitting in with the character of the neighborhood. So, do we have the pictures? Yeah, yeah, oh, there. okay. The, the one at the top there, those are the, a few of the houses that are located in the area as a matter of fact, they want to put the mobile home to the right of the house at the top. Now, <clears throat> also, during that time when the uh, application was denied, uh, Reverend Spearman uh, gave uh, the commission that he was going to build their 60 by 40 garage and workshop. That's over the one that's yeah down at the bottom. <clears throat> now in eight years, that's the uh, workshop in garage. So uh, a lot of things he, he promised a lot of things and, and he's not going through with any of them. Uh, on the uh, permit, the permit was for a modular home, not a mobile home. Uh, so we are concerned about the neighborhood. Uh, 
uh, mobile home is going to bring the value down on, on the houses, and you're seeing some of the houses in the neighborhood. And that's, that's, that's how we're concerned. Thank you. And uh, I know some of, your, some of your group spoke with Dr. Ward back there. Were you involved in those discussions? Right. Okay. All right, any questions? Commissioner Epperson. Uh, Mr. Wagner, you've spoken with uh, Mr. Ward, right? Have you spoken with Ken Ward? Uh, yeah. Back? Yeah, okay. What about uh, Alan Clark? We haven't talked with him. I haven't. Okay, well, I I'll suggest that you get together with them, make sure they explain uh, quite explicit as to just what's happening there. Uh, also, I would suggest that you would uh, make sure that they got proper permitting because I think you called me while this was going before the uh, the trailers was actually, I mean, the mobile home was actually put on the lot. Right. You know, and we had been trying to uh, contact, I think, Mr. Reginald Jordan, and I had recommended that they get with you all and come out and visit the site. We can get a clear understanding as to what's going on. Correct, correct. Uh, the the permit is for a module and not a not a not a mobile home. I also have a petition signed by uh, the residents of Rice Road that I can leave. Uh, are you familiar? If there, are, you, are there any hearings scheduled with the? Uh, let's see. I guess this is less. This is within that five mile limit. So I guess that will be on the MPC. You know, if they have any hearings scheduled relative to this, uh, they don't have any. Because uh, on that, you know, usually they, they would put up a, a zoning sign, a zoning exception. Mm -hmm. N no one was notified, and no sign or anything was, was placed where uh, the residents of Wright Road would, could see it. So unless, uh, to my knowledge, unless there was some action of the uh, Metropolitan Planning Commission, which I think I guess with what they got going on now would come to us through an appeal process. I don't know. But I would suggest that you get with Mr. Clark and uh, Mr. Ward and, and, you know, see if you get some further clarification. All right. Okay. One second. Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Epson, is that you done? Yes. Commissioner Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for being here to share your concerns with us, Mr. Wyandon. May I ask you the address of the site in question for the mobile homes slash modular house permit? Uh, it's going to be 4685 Rice Road. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Mr. President. Commissioner Chavez. Thank you, President. When was the, uh, the request for the modular home put in, uh, sir? It was applied uh, 531 of this year. So the, uh, okay, 2020. Uh, uh, hold on and, and it was issued uh, June the 21st. Mr. Clark, is this within the five mile? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Looking to see if this was one of the ones that was sent out on the neighborhood participation where we started doing that postcard. Uh, would this fall in that? I guess I need to clear up a couple of things because there's a lot of uh, misinformation that's going around uh, the, this room presently. Uh, this is a modular home. This home was verified by the MPC staff with the company of Brewer Manufacturing Housing in uh, Bolger City. Uh, we, have ver we have reviewed the specs and determined that this is a modular home. The reality of the entire situation is if it was a manufactured home on an acre or more land, uh, it was a use by right and it still could have gone on the site. Uh, this, is a, this is a right that the Cattle Parish Commission granted after the city of Shreveport granted the same rights to uh, properties inside the city limits of Shreveport. Uh, we've explained this to one of, one of the applicants, uh, Mr. Fry, that we've explained this to him, uh, that uh, there's nothing that is appealable. There was no need for a neighborhood participation plan meeting. There was no need for notification because this is all rural agricultural property. And in rural agricultural property, uh, 
manufactured homes that uses by rights. And that became effective in 2017 with the adoption of the Caddo Parish Unified Development Code. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clark, for the explanation. Thank you, President. That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Chavez. Commissioner Johnson. He answered my question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to make this statement. Okay. Uh, Reverend uh, Spearman, he owns 30 acres. So with one mobile home there, uh, and if you're going by a uh, mobile home per acre, he could put 30. That's correct. Now you have a trailer park. And, and that's how we're concerned. Is a, I suppose there's a different, Mr. Clark, could you come back up, please? No problem. When you get into the things that uh, Mr. Winden, I think was his name, is alluding to, that would require actions by the Cattle Parish Planning and zoning commission and approval by you. Uh, the property would, a bubble home park would have to be approved. Uh, there could be subdivision. The 30 acres could be subdivided into acre lots, 30 acre lots, uh, but that subdivision would also have to be approved by you. But as it stands now, it's one modular home on, thir on a 30 acre track of land, a lot of record, and it is a use by right, and the courts have consistently upheld that where there's a use by right in accordance with your ordinance, there is nothing that we can do to prohibit it from happening. Thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner, you can sit down, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Commissioner Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, for Mr. Winden, I was just wondering, I was trying to find this on my Google Maps Street View. Is the home visible from the from rice road from the street or is it set back so it can't be seen uh it's visible but they you might it might not be on google i might have to drive down to see it um uh, because they only moved it in last week oh it's only been there a week i see mm. but it's on a 30 acre tract of land right i see uh i i, I would like to address that that uh, 30 acres <coughs> if the owner decides to uh sell the 30 acre lots. I mean, since it's by use, each one of them could bring a trailer. And that way you, you, you got 30 trailers and no trailer. So, so you know, you would run into that, that, that situation also. That's all I had, Mr. Rand. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clark. Okay, that brings us I, to- I got a question on the board. Who does? I do. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Johnson, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Clark, can you come back up? <clears throat> By the UDC standard, what is the definition of a modular home and what is the definition of a mobile home? Well, a modular home is a home that's in compliance with the International Residential Building Code, and that's the same code that the homes that the gentleman was alluding to is approved in accordance with. A, mod a manufactured home is in compliance with the HUD code. They're totally different codes, uh, and that's, what, that's the separation between modular and manufactured. All right, now what about a, a mobile? But manufactured is a mobile. Okay. So, it was, I guess to my understanding, and a lot of the people I know feel the same way, that with a mobile home, whether it's a single, double, triple wide, if it comes in on wheels mm -hmm. and they set it up and it's, a, it's got a the hitch on it, then that's forever going to be a, a mobile home. And, you know, we're we finding that uh, modular homes are uh, being transported the same way. I was listening to uh, Mr. Friday sit, talk about the, uh, the tongs on the two sections of the modular home. Uh, but it's by the code uh, that governs the construction of the actual home 
and that's what we have verified. But like I said, uh, even if it was a manufactured home, by being on a 30-acre trike, uh, it still would be a use by right. Uh, as many of you know, if you are, you know, wanting to preserve a certain standard of housing in a particular subdivision, generally uh, property owners do subdivision covenants. And this is what governs what can and what cannot go into a particular subdivision. But in the case of uses by right, the Cattle Parish Planning Commission Board or the Cattle Parish Commission cannot prohibit someone from doing on their land what the ordinance allows. Okay, so that was one of the things I had talked to the some of the ones out in the lobby about is having a neighborhood covenant. Um, and they might need some direction on how to get that done as quickly as possible. Right, and, and they just need to hire an attorney, and an attorney can draw up those covenants uh, that details and outlines uh, what type of housing is acceptable, what type of housing is not acceptable. The problem that comes to, to the forefront, because I drove down Rice Road uh, today, and there is a blend of different type of housing on Rice Road. It's not just the, the the housing type that you saw, but there you know there are smaller homes. There are homes that even there's one home that even resembles a manufactured home. Uh, so I don't know if you know going forward uh, if if that would be you know really viable. But that's an option that the the citizens have and like you, we would recommend that if it is a concern that, uh, that uh, manufactured homes will come, that that is one avenue that they have that could prevent uh, the further development of manufactured homes. So if we keep them as a RA1 or 7, then you could put one of those in. I, I pulled that up, but I hope I can get it real quickly for you. Uh, the, what happens in the parish is RA on an acre of lot and on an acre of land or more, uh, a manufactured home is a use by right. RE, which is 25,000 square foot lot, is prohibited. R112 and R through R17, uh, it's a special exception use. In the ordinance now it calls for the ZBA, but we all know that uh, because of the, the new laws that that would be the Cattle Parish Planning and Zoning Commission. In R5, which is 5,000 square feet, it is prohibited. But you still, you know, have, and that's what I was talking about earlier, you have the residential mobile home park and the residential mobile home subdivision where they would be a use by right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Burrell. Just one quick question. <clears throat> you, mentioned, you mentioned that they could create a covenant, but this 30 acres is not part of It's part of the subdivision. Huh? It's part of the subdivision. Oh, it is? Yes. It, it is part In of our, the subdivision. In our opinion, it's part of the subdivision. I forget the name of the subdivision, but back in 2014, you know, when the, the mobile home was denied, it was denied because the application was for secondary residential structure, and that would have been two mobile homes on one lot. And that was why it was denied based on the character of the subdivision where it was improper f to allow the two mobile homes on one lot in, in that particular but they subdivision. Could have, they could have had one on there. They could have, they could have, they could have subdivided, but he chose to do May, uh, secondary residential. That was in 2014. Well, it appears that it, at least uh, I don't think you're going to be able to deny this, but uh, this mobile home there by right, but at least a covenant would keep the perpetuation of uh, additional. Uh, well, you know, in general, uh, Commissioner Burrell, uh, this has been in effect since 2017. And it's worked extremely well because in the parish you generally have large tracts of land that that gear themselves to allow for manufactured housing. Uh, in special circumstances, uh, you have like this situation 
you have where maybe property owners would like to prohibit manufactured housing, and that's why I just suggested the way to do that is through neighborhood covenants. And since this is a neighborhood, since it is now, a neighborhood, it can uh, a covenant would apply. A covenant way. could be drawn up and filed, and although we do not enforce covenants. Uh, covenants are enforced because there are agreements between property owners. It would allow the property owners to determine what could happen. And they take that to court. They don't take it to you all. You're right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Burrell. <laughs> Mr. Uh, or Commissioner Jackson. Yeah, no, I think part of my question was asked about the enforcement of the covenants, and this wouldn't necessarily fix. doesn't sound like it would be a remedy for the current situation. No, sir. Uh, but it can go forward. It would deal with it. But my last question is maybe one for Attorney Frazier. Is would the neighborhood have to incorporate in order to do the covenant, or would they just do it as individual neighbor property owners? Or would that be given legal advice? <laughs> that would probably veer over into legal advice. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. I think we're. We're no problem. I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions. I, you know, to make the neighbors feel better about what has transpired. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay, uh, Mr. Clark. All right. The next item uh, is a uh, visitor, the town of Greenwood Alderman. Uh, no, it's not that. Commissioner Epperson, do we have a guest here? No. The letter. Oh, that's the letter. Is that? Okay, well, I understand that, but uh, I'll 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 read the the letter during my my uh, report. Okay, so you'd like me to go ahead and advance on? Yes, please. Okay, um, that brings us to uh, really the master plan update. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Clark just sat back down, but we are um, <laughs> at the master plan update portion of the agenda now. I would be even more brief than I was the first time around, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Uh, we are waiting uh, in order to start with updates to the master plan. We're just patiently waiting for your action today with the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, once we get a board in place, then we have, I mean, we have a temporary board, but once we get a permanent board in place, we have some recommendations that we're interested in making. Uh, we're doing some uh, in interesting things inside the city limits of Shreveport that may be acceptable out in the parish. One of those things is monitoring uh, uh, short-term rentals. Uh, we are we can we have a wonderful program to monitor short-term rentals. We've identified that there are short-term rentals uh, north on the north side across Lake, uh, outside in the uh, five-mile limit. Uh, and basically, it's not a, a prohibition. It's not a restriction. It just registers these uh, uh, short-term rentals. And sometimes, unfortunately, they present problems uh, because these are a transient-type rental facilities that sometimes, without oversight, uh, neighbors are inflicted with uh, loud noises and other type things. So that's one of the things that, that we're looking at. and. Real, real quickly, uh, we also have found that with the influx uh, because of transportation and the influx of 18-wheel traffic inside the city limits of Shreveport and Caddo Parish, that we're developing a standards for 18-wheel parking because the present ordinance says that gravel is prohibited and that the surface can only be asphalt or uh, concrete. We have found that there are options to that uh, with the services of engineering firms and so forth and we're trying to uh, we will have that uh, before the city council uh, next week but we would like to get it before you uh, because there is a truck parking facility in Caddo Parish that's presently uh, in non-compliance that this property this possibly could assist Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, Commissioner Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Clark, I had a couple questions about yes, short-term rentals. Uh, have, we have we received complaints about short-term rentals located in the parish? We have not received any complaints about short-term
long-term rentals in the parish. So we're just trying to, you know, provide that service to the parish if this commission and the Long Range Planning Commission and the Cattle Parish Planning and Zoning Commission think it's, it's warranted. Um, so just to follow up on that, I know that we've discussed this in Long Range Planning before. I think it was Long Range Planning. Um, so if there's, say, for instance, a noisy short-term renter and the neighbors have a problem with it, would it be inside the city limits, it would be the police and, and the parish, it would be the sheriff who enforce the rules about that, is that right? The first thing would be the property owner would be notified because uh, each prop, each house to both sides and back in front of the property would have the uh, phone number of the uh, actual owner of the uh, short-term rental. So that's something you would provide? Yes, sir. And they would be responsible for addressing uh, those type situations. And as you well know, if, if it's not uh, addressed, then the Kettle Parish Sheriff would have to be called. And then um, how much does the registration cost for a short-term rental? Uh, I, I think, uh, Commissioner Young, uh, it's like $125 for registration of uh, one. Uh, is that per year or is it a one-time That's fee? per year. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Young. Commissioner Chavez. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. What about I'm sorry, Commissioner Chavez. I, I jumped sure. over Commissioner Braille. My apologies. Let, let me back up to, to the uh, uh, parking of 18 wheels in the, yes, sir. In the subdivision. Yes. Sir. That's always been a problem. Um, you, you're saying that they're developing an ordinance to deal with it based upon whether it is a gravel surface or a paved surface? Yeah. And they can still park in, in subdivision? You cannot legally park an 18-wheeler on residential as own property. That is a very serious problem inside the city limits of Shreveport. Right. Uh, Shreveport police has uh, begun to address that problem in residential districts and shopping centers. The only place that 18 wheelers can park are industrial areas, I-1 and I-2. Uh, but the problem was that we were received information from developers and contractors was that because of the cost of concrete and asphalt, doing parking lots were prohibited, cost prohibitive. But there were other alternative uh, surfaces that could maintain the, the, the weight of 18 wheelers and ensure that uh, fluids would not uh, come through and absorb into the, uh, the soil and so forth. So that's why we've come up with uh, an alternative approach to doing parking lot, but parking lots and parking surfaces. But we have trucks being parked in residential subdivisions that is illegal and it's very offensive. So we're trying to solve that problem. But by solving that problem, we're trying not to hurt the actual companies that provide the transportation services and so forth. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you Commissioner Burrell. Commissioner Chavez. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, President. Uh, Director Clark, I, I know you, you know that I've been working on this with you for a while, and it's, it's not uh, the MPC's fault that we're in this situation. Um, I was just talking with some gentlemen that are opening up a 18-wheeler parking lot in uh, Texarkana because they've, they've ran off from Shreveport and said they, they can't do business here anymore because of the situation. Um, the, and this is not the 18-wheeler parking lot that you and I have been dealing with. This is a right. whole different one. It was, it was unfortunate for me to run into these gentlemen and, and hear this out of their mouth. Um, the one that you and I have been discussing uh, he's still in violation. Is the other one off of 3132, are they allowed to be open? Are they within regs? The one off of 3132 is actually in the parish of Caddo and not in the city of Shreveport. And it's in violation of the Caddo Parish Unified Development Code. What we're trying to do, and that's why I was mentioning it to uh, this body, we're trying to uh, incorporate uh, some of these alternative sur surfaces in order to bring that particular parking lot into compliance. I think she's done an incredible job with the facility. Uh, she got ahead of the, the uh, cart before the horse and went and, and laid uh, gravel and, and some other surfaces and then started tr parking the trucks. But we're trying to work very diligently with her. We're not you know, doing any 
uh, punitive act actions against her. We're trying to work with her and the Caddo Parish Public Works in order to get you to adopt uh, this alternative uh, surface ordinance so that this particular parking lot will become legal. This, and Dr. Wilson, this is one of the situations we spoke about in economic development where I wanted to get our engineering department to come up with a surface um, that if we're waiting on the city of Shreveport's engineering that we don't have to, that, that our engineers come up with a surface uh, that we can write into the UDC and adopt for us so that hopefully the city of Shreveport can mirror that. Um, but in the interim, uh, I, I fear what Mr. Clark's saying with shutting down the two that are incumbent, the two 18-wheeler parking lots, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a, a huge issue. And I would like to figure out if there's a solution that we can have from Caddo Parish where if we have some, some area with a, a huge parking lot that we can allow 18 wheelers to park on, and of course, I, I know risk is going to is jumping up and down, but we can, we can uh, have them sign a hold harmless where the, the drivers uh, can go online and fill out a form where, where we don't get sued, that they can park there. Um, it, until we get a solution for these 18-wheeler parking lots, because as it stands right now, I think there's only two. And if we shut down both of those that are within the city of Shreveport, even though one's in the parish, but it still falls in the UDC, then what happens to all these drivers? And if all these drivers take their trucks home because this is their level of employment, that they have to have this truck to, to do their job, mm -hmm. and then we cite them with it when they're in the neighborhood, then... We're, we're just running out our transportation and we're running out our jobs. We have to come up with a solution. Um, so I, and I know they're working on that and, and that's not even why I got on the board. So I, I just wanted to mention that. But uh, Director Clark, what I did want to ask you is, I know to Commissioner Young's point on the uh, VRBOs, it's a stipulation of 500 feet. Um, and I've already been contacted by some of those owners that are saying that that's a little bit too much um, have we looked at other neighborhoods and, and seen if maybe a reduction to 100 feet uh, is available? And, and you may want to touch on, because I, I feel my colleagues don't know what we're talking about in, in regards to this. The, what, what the uh, special exception use approval before ZBA entails is if a, if a short-term rental is within 500 feet of another short-term rental, they have to get a special exception use. Uh, to allow the second uh, short-term rental. This was to prevent cluttering. Uh, what we were afraid that was going to happen is there would become popular, popular areas of the city and when one uh, short-term rental went in, that would be 10 to come in and they would at some point possibly be side by side. And that was, as you've listened to citizens today, we felt that that would have a negative impact on a residential subdivision. So in order to uh, prevent that from happening, we came up with that 500 foot ratio, ra feet ratio, ratio of uh, uh, separating uh, short term rentals. We would consider anything that, you know, this is the thing that we continue to say is <laughs> that we never stop researching. We never stop investigating. We never stopped trying to come up with better ways, but we had to do something uh, because all of a sudden these short-term rentals start registering, and they were all in you know, particular areas of the city, and we had to give the citizens an opportunity, and that's what we've heard here today. We had to give the citizen the opportunity to determine whether or not they wanted five short-term rentals in their neighborhood. And that's the reason that we did that. It may not have been the greatest idea, but that was the basis for doing it. I got it. Okay, thank you, President. Thank you, Commissioner Savez. Commissioner Jackson. Yeah, uh, Ms. Clark, I think uh, to add, I guess, some equity or whatever to the conversation about short-term rentals, short-term rentals are essentially a business. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, you know, they, they, some courts have determined that they're business. Some courts have determined that they're residential uses. Uh, it, they, they don't have to have commercial zoning, and commercial uses have to be zoned commercially. So, in in essence, they, they're considered. Uh, you know, like you don't consider if you have a home and you rent it out long term, you don't consider that necessarily a business. That's just a home you're renting out. Right. 
But in some municipalities, they're taxing them. Do we tax them here? Well, that's that's why we are going through this process okay. because they they need to be paying those occupancy okay. tax rates and so forth. And, and so what I'm saying is, what I don't want to see us is sort of turn a blind eye to this issue, and then when the hotel motel association come because they are coming mm -hmm. to say, well, you're taxing us, but you're not taxing them, right? And you need to create, as we talked about with the casino situation, equity. And now we have this 360. <laughs> we do this about face because the lobbyists are down here standing in front of us talking about the equity and taxing the Hilton or the whatever the thing is they're building on 70th Street. Um, right. You're taxing them. You're taxing us, and we're paying out, and we're paying for infrastructure, high education, police and fire, but the short-term rentals are not. And so I think that's where... Uh, we have to talk about equity with regard to putting everybody on an even playing field, uh, as well as preserving the character of, of of neighborhoods. So that's where I think the the short term rental uh, resonates with me. I don't know if it resonates with others in that area, but it resonates with me in that we need to. I'm not saying treat them like a business, but if you're providing lodging, lodging. Um, you need to be treated as a lodging facility. And I think we have that same for the RV parks out in the parish as well. So we have RV parks that these short-term rentals are now competing with. That's also gonna you know, put a strain on the parish if we don't create the uh, equity there. And, and if I may, uh, Commissioner Jackson, <laughs> that was the reason that I was just you know, introducing the idea right. to the Cattle Parish Commission because in the city, they are paying all of those those same taxes right. that the hotels and motels are right. paying. Right. I was just introducing because when we first start talking about it, I don't think that right. the commission was very interested in the, you know registering uh, short term rentals. Right. And they still and you may still not be interested. Right. I still it, I, you know there's it, it's just my job to make you right. aware that this is what's happening and this is a trending uh, type of. Right. Uh, utilization of properties right. and it does get in conflict with hotels uh, right. because they're taking you know right. uh, occupants away occupants away from hotels uh, and, and putting them in because they are much more competitive right. because the overhead is much less than hotels so I just right. making that information right. uh, and available then to you on the uh, residential parking situation um, I don't see Tim Weaver, but I did see Ken Ward, and I, I do, we don't have to get into it now, but uh, from my position, I believe that it's not just a aesthetic nuisance and a noise nuisance having an 18 wheeler running all night or during the day, um, but it's also an infrastructure issue where the streets are not built to handle that much weight. And oh, who's over our weight division? We, we have a weight inspector. Okay. So, yeah, I, gotcha. So, um, I think there's some leverage there by looking at our weight ordinance already, and maybe lining it up with the weight ordinance, um, with what our weight ordinance says, and uh, come at it from that angle. Uh, I like the concept of the parking facilities um, because they don't belong in neighborhoods. Absolutely. And, and I get that the young men and women are trying to make a living for themselves. But we're also trying to maintain the character of neighborhoods, but we're also not trying to be repaving streets uh, every two years when we really could be paving them every eight to ten years. Right. So they're killing the lifespan of our streets, and that is truly, in my humble opinion, that's why uh, I'm glad to see the city of Shreveport stepping up and forcing within the city limits because they're, they're not, the streets are not built to handle that much weight. So. And like, like, like we said, that's why we are trying to proactively plan right. uh, for these type of uses. Right. They'll be the main one. They'll be the main one getting their regular yeah. car. So, ooh, these streets bad. Yeah. <laughs> and these trucks are not going away. Right. Uh, you know, and and there's inadequate parking at the truck stops. Although we have right. truck stops in Greenwood and Burt Coons and right. so forth, yeah, no, uh, there's not enough truck parking spaces at these facilities. So there's why there is the demand mm -hmm. for these facilities. And I think uh, Commissioner Chavez said about five 
uh, in the city of Shreveport, and none of them are actually legal. Well, maybe, hopefully, there's some entrepreneur out there who can take advantage of a legal way. It's, uh, it's going to work uh, because you know you have to get an engineer right. involved to make a recommendation to the city engineer of the city of Shreveport nice. of alternative surfaces. Okay. And once once you do that, you got engineers talking to engineers, and like I shared with my staff, it, that's who need to be talking to make the determination of what's best right. to handle all the things that you're talking about. Okay. Planners don't need to be involved in dealing with street surfaces. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Commissioner Talfaro. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Clark, uh, so what What do I get for my registration for my STRs? If I have five STRs and I have to pay a registration fee of $125 per um, building, yes, per sir. residence, what do I get for that? I mean, what's the, what, what's the money for? The money is for the process of registering, monitoring, uh, ensuring that compliance occurs, and so forth uh, with the uh, STRs. Uh, it's a minimal fee for you know the the uh, what, and most of these will be run correctly. But but it, if there are violations and other negative events, you have to have enforcement, and that's what covers that enforcement additional enforcement costs. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Talfaro. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Short-term rentals you're talking about you know, for the public, uh, you're kind of talking about these Airbnb. Airbnbs, right. I think it's VRBO. Right. And so there, 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 there are about 10 other platforms that But those I platforms that people will typically use going out of town somewhere, right. if they're going in a large number of family members, They'll, they'll go into one of those instead of the hotel because the hotel you get each room you're going to get charged for it. Airbnb is one price but right. you can divide that price up to compensate what you're trying to do um, on the 18 wheelers you know one of the things that are tan of the parish roads to me is all the trucks the sand trucks and the water trucks that are constantly going up and down those parish roads and they're parking and they're sitting to the side of the road and they, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, so with the parking, you know, we got to do something because transportation is a very important part of how this economy rolls. And for us to say, well, there's no way for you to park your 18 wheeler, you can't park it here, you can't park it there. And if somebody buys a piece of land that is not tied to a neighborhood and said, okay, we put a road down through here through the woods and clear it out, and so I'm going to start parking 18 wheelers here, and it's not in the neighborhood, and then we come back and say, well, you know, you can't do that. Um, that's sort of like telling me I can't cut down a tree, you know, if I'm out there by myself and I want <laughs> this tree down. So we, we got to come to some kind of medium in which – it's, it's, if it's in the neighborhood, I can I can truly understand it because you don't want trust going through your neighborhood. But if it's a piece of land by itself, nobody nearby, and you can find this use for it, that person should have that use for that land. And 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 I, I will just uh, respond that uh, you know if you find a piece of land and we say that truck parking is only allowed on industrially zoned properties then a simple rezoning application to get it uh, is rezoned to industrial and meeting the use standards that are associated with, uh, you know, the truck park and the, the type of services that it, it requires, possibly screening if necessary. But uh, we are constantly saying that we have to provide adequate spaces for 18-wheeler parking because there's an enormous amount in the, in the city of Shreveport. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing. Uh, but that's what we do every day is uh, a study uh, what's happening around the country. Uh, oddly enough, I was in South Carolina in the county, uh, and there was a truck parking facility where gravel was being used. Uh, 
and I did not see any gravel being transferred onto the the street, but it's been uh, shared with us that if you have gravel, it will not be able to hold up and support the weight of 18 wheelers. But we, we're, we're not trying to prevent any of these parking facilities from ha what happening. As I share with uh, Council Commissioner Chavez, that but when someone just goes out and sets up a parking lot and others are being told that you have to go through this process, it creates a problem. Okay, and also with the uh, short-term rentals, are we looking at those from other uh, areas, you know, that, that basically there's a lot of them? Yes, I mean, we, we, we study uh, every time we, we come up on a new use, we study cities uh, comparable sizes to the city of Shreveport. We don't go and try to determine. I think there are like uh, eight to 10,000 uh, more short-term rentals in New Orleans, so that's not uh, actually apples to apples. But we look at other cities in the state of Louisiana and uh, in the state of Alabama and in, in the state of uh, uh, Georgia and so forth. When we come up with these rules and, and regulations that we use to govern short-term rentals, I don't think, uh, in, in all fairness, I don't think, uh, you know, there, that our ordinance is, is, is real, real restrictive. Uh, it's, uh, it just requires that they are registered, it requires that they don't clutter, and it requires that they follow simple use standards. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're going to be here. I mean, if we are, I was listening to, and, I, and I'm glad that I was here today, listening to your lobbyists. If the, if the state of Louisiana is constantly losing population and Caddo Parish is losing population, then we're going to have to be doing things and coming up with ways to bring people to Caddo Parish. And being truly super prohibitive is not one of those ways, but we have to study to find what will keep young people, uh, millennials, uh, in the city of Shreveport and in Caddo Parish and not have them go uh, east uh, or south from, from uh, the city. And that's what we're doing, just trying to come up with a way with what will bring young people back to the city, what will keep young people in the city. Because as you all well know, we send our children off to college, they get the training and the, the education that we want them to get, but then they go to Dallas, Atlanta, Birmingham or uh, other places, we have to come up with ways and that's why we are uh, trying to clear up that image that the MPC is prohibitive. We have to find ways to bring these young people back to Shreveport and Ghetto Parish. And I think too also at the time people purchase land, they have to know what is legal to do with and what's illegal to do with instead of getting it and then trying to do it and then find out they can't do it. And I don't know, Commissioner Johnson, any better way we have, uh, you know, we have the ordinances on online. We, I mean, we, we have a, a truly spiffy web page that outlines everything and all the requirements that, are, that you all helped us with, that outlines all the requirements, the type of zoning. We have a zoning map that they can look and find if the property that they're looking at is properly zoned. And then we have a staff that's available to answer any questions that anyone would have uh, five days a week. But that's, that's going by a traditional business plan. A lot of things that are happening now is basically an ideal that becomes a hustle, <laughs> that becomes something that they can actually do. So, you know, you just got to figure out how to get that group that's, that's constantly trying to figure out how to make extra money, how to make do, do things happen in Shreveport that they see other places without having to sit down and have an attorney sitting beside them to decipher what's going on. And that's what we're trying to, to figure out. That's, uh, I mean, and we, we're open to any suggestions because, you know, we cannot control someone that does exactly what you're saying. Right. They, they, they see somebody somewhere else. They say, that looks like a great idea. I'm going to do it. And you have laws in Streetport and Caddo Parish that says this is the process that you go through in order to do this. Uh, but we are open and we, we're, we're trying to, to make ourselves more visible 
uh, doing some more. I was looking at the Caddo Parish uh, Commission uh, administration as you advertise the things that are happening in Caddo Parish. We are trying to start doing that to try to get the word out to citizens. Uh, what we do, how we do it, what they need to do, if they have an idea, and where to come. I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you all so much today. All right, that uh, brings us to the administrative report. Let me just uh, let me just point out to everyone that we are over two hours into a meeting and we haven't made it to our new business yet <laughs> so if we dr dr wilson if you could keep yours tight and then it, if we could keep our communique tight that might help everybody at the end of the meeting mr president i actually was going to make a motion if it's okay Go ahead. Uh, to suspend the agenda and adopt these ordinances and resolutions I was just make a motion to suspend the agenda. Adopt or advance? Advance, I'm sorry. To advance these ordinances and special resolutions. So so you're wanting to basically wrap wrap up the meeting, is that what I'm hearing? Well, <laughs> no, I was saying let's take these now and then come back for administrative report and commission remarks. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion for Commissioner like Jackson, a second from Commissioner Lazarus. Commissioner Jackson, just for the clerk's sake, would you please re repeat your motion? Uh, yes, I was going. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the agenda at this time, so basically go out of order to adopt <laughs> the all of the ordinances and all of the resolu special resolutions and authorize authorizations on here so so it's essentially to take the agenda out of order to advance the items under the new business section yes. to, to, to okay. correct. thank you for putting that in a short way <laughs> to adopt all of the new business items okay we have a motion advance. to adopt all to advance, advance, advance. all advance. the new to, we you. have a motion to suspend the agenda to advance all of the items in new business and then come back into the agenda right all right uh any comments yeah i got one commissioner johnson yeah and this on the first one um ordinance number 6256 um <clears throat> mr clark looking at that piece of property uh i know you said that if it's a ra that you can put a manufactured home on that um but keeping it as a r17 will restrict that to special use only. Mr. Clark, please come up. I just want to make sure you want me to come back up, Mr. President. I did, because of my question. No problem. So yeah. keeping that property as a R17 will be, will restrict mobile homes from coming into that area. Well, you know, with, with the R17, you could go before the Caterpillar. Special use permit. You yeah. had to get a special use yeah, permit. Special Instead use of permit. But the RA, it would be automatic. They can do it. This, this was an application. Uh, we did some restoration zoning uh, out, of, out in the area where, because of the UDC, we reduced the zoning from RA to R17. This is not one of those cases, but while we were doing that, one, the, one of the applicants was at our meeting that just wanted their property because it's a large track of land to return back to rural agriculture. They have no desire to do a mobile home park or anything of that nature. They want to do some rural agricultural type uses. Uh, but uh, you look at the, the, the north of the property, everything up there is, is res rural agriculture. So Right, but south of the property, that part that's on North Lakeshore Drive, you got those half million to million dollar houses that are on there and I don't right. want them to be faced with having a, a mobile home across the street from them. You know, it may be something uh, of consideration to this body uh, that uh, maybe this is not gonna work in the parish. Uh, that uh, if that's a fear that we have, that then maybe we should make uh, manufactured housing in the parish a special exception use. Yeah, it really needs to be. Um, I mean, because I've, I've just listened. I mean, we're, we're not insensitive, and I'm not insensitive to those citizens out on Rice Road. But if that's the concern, we don't want to 
get to be too restrictive and too prohibitive, but uh, if that's a concern, that could solve that. Okay. If this body just, you know, tell us to uh, go back and present this to the Cattle Parish Planning and Zoning Commission okay. to come to you, then we can do this. I think you need to. Personally. Are you good? Are you good, Commissioner Johnson? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. I'm down again, Mr. President. Sir? I'm sitting down again. Yes, sir. I'm trying to get your exercise. You're done? Yes. Okay, thank you. I, I can advance it then and shoot it down. Okay. Um, all right, we have Commissioner Jackson's motion uh, on the floor. Seeing, seeing no one on the board, let's vote. <coughs> All right, that motion carries with 10 in support, none in opposition, and two absent. Okay, thank you. So uh, that advances all of our items from the motion to go uh, back into regular business. agenda. Second. We have a motion to go from Commissioner Jackson to go back into regular agenda, a second by Commissioner John Paul Young. Um, it take all the time you need. <laughs> let's have a vote on going back into regular session. Dr. Wilson, let's take all the time. Acclamation. 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 Okay, we're back in. All right, we are now at uh, administrator's report. Is that correct, Mr. Clark? Yes, sir. I have a dissertation today, sir, not a report. Okay. <laughs> as long as it's two minutes. Okay. <laughs> all right, Dr. Wilson. Okay, it, it'll be very quick. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, in the juvenile detention center, we had 22 children. Nine of the, the 22 are 17 year olds, and we have five awaiting OJJ transportation to another location. We currently have seven at CCC. Uh, just, uh, just for your knowledge, we'll, we'll have a capital project starting at, at uh, the detention center pretty soon, within a couple of weeks or so, to, to renovate uh, pods. This is a fire marshal requirement, so we'll be down, we'll have to close one pod while this renovation work has taken place over eight weeks and we are working closely with the judges to do so. Uh, COVID uh, cases, we had three uh, confirmed cases the last uh, in August and in, uh, in, uh, for the Cal Parish Commission organization, one agency report. Just for the first week of September, we have three uh, organizational COVID confirmed cases and one agency case. Okay, also, uh, I'm pleased to inform you all that the, you remember the Veterans Service Center that was destroyed by Hurricane Laura a few years ago? It's, it's, it's been rebuilt, and we plan to have an opening on the, uh, on the 19th of September, and we'll have some kind of ribbon cutting, because this is our new Veterans Service Center, rebuilt on the same site that it was destroyed on, newer building. A newer look, and uh, we want to celebrate this, that achievement and opening up that facility. And that should uh, conclude my report for the day, sir, unless you have anything for me. Thank you. That's it, Dr. Wilson? Yes, sir. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Clark? I have a oh, sorry. question for Commissioner Dr. Young has a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Wilson, can yes, you sir. tell me what the status is of the tranquilizer guns for... Uh, C pass. Uh, you want an update on it? Yes. Yes, sir. They are here. So let me uh, have Mr. Calvin call you. Okay, forward. terrific. Give you a quick update on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, Commissioner Burrell? Do you have a question? Go right ahead. Go ahead, Calvin. Okay. Ahead. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Young, the uh, tranquilizer guns are here. We have the X caliber and the X two. Um, I wrote up a very definitive policies and procedures. Um, so that is actually at legal. They're going to overlook Ms. it and Ms. we'll Mayor, add those policies. I think there's a question that could be coming up for you in just one minute and we'll, we'll get to you. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. They'll add those policies and procedures into an addendum for our current policies that was written in July 2018. Okay, so <laughs> can the tranquilizer guns be used today? Not today because the policy for using right. them has to be approved by legal? Right, it's and we also, we also have to get a parts per million for rumpum, zolazine, and telazol. Which so is those are control. drugs that we don't yes. have in our possession? We do have those drugs, but she has to get a parts per million for it. So Is that it? means diluting them? Yes. How many hours should that take? Once she figured that out, uh, that's like a day. Okay, today, so, so it could be ready tomorrow. It can be. Okay. Um, Attorney Frazier, do you have the policies that uh, Mr. Samuel was mentioning regarding tranquilizer use guns for your review? 
Yes, I received those at the end of last week. Okay. Um, how soon can you review those policies for your approval? Um, there is a pack of wild dogs terrorizing people in my neighborhood today. We talked about these tranquilizer guns months ago so that the next time there was a pack of wild dogs, we could take them down and put them in the pound. I want those guns deployed in my neighborhood this week. Can you do that? I will do my best. Thank you very much. Thank so you, Dr. Did, Wilson. Do we have the location on, on that situation? Dr. Oh, uh, okay. Mr. Samuels has them. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. President. You could probably stay up. Commissioner Burrell. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Well, Samuels might, might want to come back up. <laughs> <laughs> we have another location that we have the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, I would be nicer. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. But anyway, uh, I had turned in, in uh, a report of a, a white pit bull on uh, 3329 Sunset Drive. All right. That uh, City Councilman Bowman uh, wound up getting his ankle broken over. Did anybody go and check that? Yes. I had an officer go out that Saturday. Um, he made contact with the owner, and I'll do follow-up. I know the owner has the dog contained at this particular time. <coughs> so I'll, I'll conduct follow-up and see where it is. Do we know whether he was, was that, you, do we know whether he was just loose or? or? It was at large. It, yes, it was at large. We did find the owner. Okay. All right, thank you. And they got a summons. <coughs> also, just to go back on those tranquilizer guns, part of that also is to, notify CSO and SPD prior to going out. We can't just go out and deploy. And yes, out. yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kelly. Martha Merrick. Yeah, Merrick. Uh, Ms. Merrick, if you would. I just had a question on something that I had uh, wasn't sure of. <clears throat> Are you all planning to move out of our district? <laughs> so we did move. You did move already? We moved in... Um, April of nineteen of twenty twenty one to two eight five Mount Zion Road. Yeah. Where? Two eight five Mount Zion Road. Mount Zion. So we're District between thirty one thirty two and Burt Coons, I forty nine and Linwood Avenue. So Charlotte has got to you. Is that yes. Good? Yes. It's a beautiful facility. <laughs> well, you know, it solved a lot of our problems. We were, so when we first moved into the building that we were in on um, Texas Avenue, we were distributing about a million pounds of food a year. And when we left, we were distributing 1.8 million pounds of food a month in the same size building. And so it was just, we really needed to expand. Mm -hmm. Plus it increased our refrigeration and freezer space so that not only can we distribute more food, but healthy food. About 20 to 25% of what we distribute is fresh produce, fresh produce, dairy, and meat. And so we feel like we're serving the community better. Although we loved our location on Texas Avenue, we feel like we're serving our community better with healthier foods in our new location. So we're not, we're not um you utilizing that that space you you moved everything over we did and we actually sold the building okay well i'll let you Sorry. get off on that one I, okay i guess but we are better serving the community so for the greater good um we're in a in a bigger <coughs> building now we do have long-term plans to build a food pantry next door to where we are on mount Zion road Temporarily, we turned our food pan the old food bank into a food pantry where people could go to receive food, and um, it was hugely needed and did a remarkable, remarkable amount of um, service in a very, very short time. And so fortunately, we sold the building, but we're going to build a, a $2 million facility right next door to where we are. Well, so. my, my concern is, given where it's located, right. it was located two or more uh, impoverished area and you move all the facility uh, <coughs> over there to Mount Zion which I don't have a problem with and where will the people I mean how how are the people access absolutely the, uh, 
it's an excellent question and we struggle with the same um, the same concerns that you know if you don't have money for food you don't have money for gas and we don't want you driving all over looking for food we um, we did work with the uh, the group uh, at Mount Canaan Baptist Church on hmm, I'm going to draw a blank on the street. Ashton Street. Ashton Street. Ashton, I think. Ashton, that's correct. And they opened a the food pantry there. And so where we are not distributing food from Texas, Mount Canaan is. So we feel like we're still somewhat that, in, in the neighborhood. You know whether or not that would be adequate? Well, they have access to a lot of food. They can order whatever they need to serve the community. We won't put limits on what they can have. Uh, what they can have. So right. they, they have an abundance available to them. Well, again, that's my concern that the people have access uh, to, you know, to the facility. Absolutely. And we share the same concern. We also have a food pantry on Missouri Street right off of um, Greenwood Road. So we're not too far from that also. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Well, well Ms. Merrick is up front. Does anyone have a question for her or so she, maybe she can get home this evening? Well, that's fine. This, I'm happy to a, stay. This is a comment she may, she may not know, but um, on Lakeshore, there's a, uh, another food distribution and, and they order food from there. It's called Five Loaves and Two Fish and they serve that area so people can just walk there and, and get food. Oh, well, I'll tell you about that. It, it ties up the traffic over there. Yeah, they are two and three blocks long uh, along Lakeshore, and, and, and that's a, a thoroughfare. We're going to have to look at We're going to have to relook at that location. Miss Martha, it sounds like we need a convenient drive through or walk through that's out of the way. Yeah, yeah, because it's not. Well, what we can do is ask Five Loaves to maybe do an additional distribution so that not everybody comes at one time to try and reduce the amount of cars. So we're happy to that, do that. <laughs> yeah, that's us. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't get through there. Yeah, okay. sorry, but we can work on that. Thank you, right, thank you. Is that what is that your item, Commissioner Chavez? I don't want her to because uh, there she she has them set out. I, I know Miss Martha probably doesn't know how many off the top of her head, but I, I see the good work that she does, and I don't I don't want it to go unknown. So, thank you, Miss Martha. Thank you, okay. thank you. Is that it for? Ms. Martha? I'm happy to stay. Okay. I can talk about the food bank all day. I think I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Commissioner Chavez, was that what you were on the board for? Nothing new? That was it. Okay. All right. Mr. Clark, I think we are moving on. That brings us then to President's report. No, we didn't need Oh, I thought we were I thought we were kind of in commissioner I thought we kind of blended into commission remarks. Oh but well I need no, to so. we're we're at communiques now. If anyone's got a, got an issue, please get on the board. Commissioner Johnson. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh there's a couple of things that I wanna uh, say or uh, kinda get addressed. Um North Lakeshore Drive, you know, we redid the roads probably about I guess about five, six years ago. Um, that road is splitting again and I know they be talking about this fatty clay, but we can't have um, fatty clay in one spot that's unique to the whole world. So we need them to come out there and look at it again. The road is splitting. And I know we went in and uh, put down a different type of base to try to keep that from happening, but it's, it's happening. And it's right there by the uh, compactor. Once you turn by the compactor and head um, further up, um, you'll see the road splitting. Um, and it's gonna get worse over a period of time, with, with especially with all this heat, rain, heat, rain, and then it's gonna get cold. It's gonna split even more. So just need to address that because that road is being traveled by many people and salt trucks and water trucks. So just need to stay on top of that one. Um, also, I was gonna ask about the um, expansion of um, Roy Road. Well, where we at on that, um, I know since it's been hot and hadn't been raining much, it's been an op opportunity to um, get that done as much as we possibly can. Um, okay, and then the last one is, I guess within the last four to five months, about four months, four to five months, and it's all it's the parish and it's also the, the city roads and the interstate. I done got six finishing nails in my tires. These roads are very dirty. I mean, they got trash. There must be a lot of construction or uh, demolition somewhere. But everybody might want to check your tires because 
uh, and they they only gonna start, you know, when the temperature changes a little bit, that they'll start leaking. But I've had six um, in my vehicle, and I had to replace tires and all that, depending on where they at. Uh, so y'all might want to check them. These roads are terrible. Floor is trash on the side. I mean, I seen a whole bumper sitting on the side of the road. Uh, that was on the interstate. I don't know where the nails are coming from because I do interstate, city roads, mm -hmm. parish roads, but we gotta do something about it. Because just the, the small uh, finishing nails are real small, but they're long, yeah. and, and they'll pick up in your tire. That's all I got. All right, thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Anyone else for communiques? Okay, then uh, I think that brings us to President's report. I was gonna read. I left with all of you a, uh, a letter from um, the Mayor Pro Tem of the Town of Greenwood, Brad Edwards. Uh, he asked that we read this uh, in the commission meeting, but I've left a copy of the meeting, a copy of the letter at all of your locations. So please uh, take a look at uh, Mayor Pro Tem Edwards' uh, letter and the efforts that, they're, that they are making in Greenwood to ensure that the water is safe and clean. Um, that, that's all I've got. And Commission Clark. Okay, that brings us to old business. We have no old business today. We've already addressed new business. Um, and so that would bring us back to uh, the second communication committee reports, which um, the only item I have there is I did want to mention and remind you all that there is uh, an, there was an appeal late on Thursday. Uh, uh, there was an appeal of a decision of the Animal Services Board uh, as required by ordinance that will be heard at your next regular session meeting this Thursday. Uh, so that's an Animal Services Board appeal. Those don't come before you very frequently, so I just wanted to give you a reminder of it today. Um, where does, that, we will where send does out that fit in the agenda and how long are they allocated? Uh, I will. I don't believe there's an allocation of time that's that's given to it. I think it, it, it's not specified, but it comes towards the end of the agenda. Okay. Um, it's typically one of the last items on the agenda. Okay. So, um, so let's see. Um, and I will send out some additional details about that case that we've received, so that okay. you'll have some some information to prep. Uh, and then that brings us to citizens' comments late arrivals, of which I have received no requests and see no citizens waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that brings us to consent agenda. Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All, all yeah. in favor say aye. aye. We'll take acclamation. Thank you all for coming today. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.